Nowadays, we have really fast internet. So, well, everything loads basically instantly and we don't even really remember the days in which, you know, things have to come in slowly. But as it stands, optimizations do exist for slower connections. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna look at several techniques of making pictures load in a manner that is sensible for slower connections. You're watching another Random Wednesday episode on 0612 TV. Hello and welcome back to another Random Wednesday episode. Now, one of the key components of the internet is images. I mean, when you load up most web pages these days, you find that the bulk of what you're loading are actually images. And what this means is, if you have a slow connection, well, your user experience on the internet could be pretty bad. I mean, just imagine what it'd be like if all the images only showed up after they were completely loaded. And what this means is, of course, well, you're going to be staring at a blank page for a very long time. Luckily for us, browsers don't do that. They are at least a little bit intelligent. And what is actually done is images are shown as they are loading. So what you're seeing right here is just a little mock-up I've created. And the whole idea is you can only load content from this locally hosted site at 50 kilobytes per second. And what this means is, of course, I have a pretty large image and it loads slowly. What you're seeing here is the image loading in real time. And as you can see, what my browser is doing is, well, it is showing whatever it has so far while it's continuing to load the image. So this is the most basic of solutions that exist out there. As far as I'm aware, basically all browsers implement at least this. So what this means is, well, at least you don't have to be staring at a blank page. However, there are some disadvantages to doing things this way. Notice for the image that was loading just now, well, you've got to wait quite a while to even know what exactly is the content of that image. So what that means is, well, even though it's better than looking at a blank page, you still need to wait. There's a possibility that content doesn't make sense and you have to sit there and let the images load for a while before you can even begin to make sense of the content. So while this solution is extremely straightforward to implement, it is not optimal. It is not the best way we can do things. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at two image formats, namely JPEG and PNG, and how they actually work around this problem, starting with PNG. PNG, or Portable Network Graphics, actually works around this using a technique called interlacing. The idea is this. Now, when you want to record an image, what you can do is you can simply note down the colors of every pixel from the top left to the bottom right. So of course to display it, well, you just run through the image and populate the colors as they come along. And that is of course one valid way to do this. But interlacing is the interesting technique in which PNGs use to make images appear to load faster. This is what PNG does. Instead of storing all the pixels from top left to bottom right, it stores every nth pixel first. As you can see from the illustration, we start off with just a sparse grid of pixels. After we've covered the entire image, we actually go back to fill in more of the missing pixels. This happens over and over again until all the pixels have been loaded. But why is that better? To understand this, let's actually watch a PNG image load. In particular, this is a PNG image that has been interlaced as mentioned earlier. And of course, we are still looking at it using that local site I've created that limits the download rate to 50 kilobytes per second. Take a look. Notice that once the image has been requested, it loads from top to bottom very quickly, despite the fact that it is clear that you're seeing a lower quality version of the image. Then once that first pass has finished, you can actually see it go back and start refining the quality of the image. This is the advantage in which the interlace method actually confers. You are able to quickly load a low quality version of the entire image so that even if you can't load it all at once, the user still has an idea what the image is about. Implementation wise, notice what your browser needs to do. On its first pass, it only has information about a very small number of pixels. 
to display a low quality image at full size, your browser is essentially spreading out the color of the loaded pixels over the area in which no information has yet arrived. As new color information arrives, they will be put in the correct positions and spread in a similar manner over area that still doesn't have data. Zooming in on our sample image, you can see that this is exactly what's happening. The image starts off as a set of single colored blocks, which becomes smaller and smaller as more pixels load. So there you go, this is interlacing, it is the technique that PNG uses for you to basically see an entire image quicker. So what you're seeing here are two browser windows. One of them is loading the original PNG file, which is not interlaced, whereas the other is actually loading the interlaced version of the image. Notice of course the difference in speed when it comes to being able to see the full image. It is worth noting at this point that a similar technique is employed in making progressive GIF files. However, as you can see, the blocks look rather different because GIF stores complete horizontal lines, but spaces lines apart for the image to load progressively. So what this means is for GIF, you get full horizontal resolution from the very beginning and vertical resolution gets refined over time, whereas for PNG, both vertical and horizontal resolution starts off low and gets progressively better. So we've looked at PNG and GIF so far, and they both use interlacing. Let us now move on to look at JPEG, which does things in a slightly more interesting way. Now, to fully appreciate how JPEG actually compresses an image, you may want to check out another video I've created because of course the process is quite long and slightly complicated. So, well, I will not be repeating all of the content here, but I'll be summarizing it in a very, very brief fashion. So, like I said, if you're interested to find out more, do check out the other video. But what I'm gonna say here is just this. Instead of representing an image as a bunch of pixels where each pixel carries color, JPEG actually breaks down an image into little squares and for every one of these squares, the colors on the inside is actually represented as a set of frequencies. What you see me doing here is essentially taking one of these little squares and showing you what happens when I tweak the frequencies. Of course, there are low frequencies and high frequencies. And of course, you can get a combination of these frequencies in both the vertical and horizontal directions. To make JPEGs load better on a slow connection, a technique called progressive JPEG is used. And in fact, all it does is it rearranges the order in which all the frequencies are represented. Here's the deal. When you save a normal JPEG image that is non-progressive, the correct term for that is a baseline JPEG image, what you're basically doing is you're describing all the frequencies for the first block. Then you move on to the second block and you describe all the frequencies for that one and basically you repeat that for every single block in the image. In a progressive JPEG, you don't do that. Instead, what you do is you describe the low frequencies for the first block. Then you move on to describe the low frequencies of the second block, and so on. What this creates is an effect that looks something like this. Once again, on our very slow connection, the first pass actually gives us a very blurry version of the image. As more of the image loads, it gets sharper and sharper. Now, this makes a lot of sense because as I explained to you, the lowest frequencies of all the blocks in the image are sent to you first. Of course, what low frequency means is a change over a large interval. And of course, what that means is you won't see a lot of detail because detail implies things that are different while being close together. Therefore, what you get in the first pass would be blurry because they are the low frequency, slow changing components. As you get further down the line, you are starting to load things of higher frequency and that of course corresponds to a greater amount of detail. And that is essentially what you're seeing when you're loading a progressive JPEG. You get more and more detail over time as the image loads. And there you go. These are the techniques employed by JPEG and PNG. There are of course pros and cons of using progressive images, and of course one big con that comes to mind immediately is the fact that additional processing is required to display it, you know, in the fashion that I've showed you just now. While this doesn't matter so much on say a desktop computer or even a laptop computer, when you're actually viewing progressive images on say a mobile device, 
you would of course expect more battery use because it takes more work to display an image that is progressively encoded. Another risk that you may face using progressive images is you may hit into compatibility issues. It is of course, like I said, slightly harder to implement, but even if you know a particular browser or a particular program doesn't support the progressive rendering, most of the time they still have a fallback. They are still able to display the image after it has fully loaded. The advantage of using progressive images are of course as we've discussed. Images appear to load faster and therefore there is a better user experience. But there is one thing we haven't touched upon and that is the file size. Now, I think intuitively what we think is, well, because this confers advantage in some sense, the file size is probably larger. Well, as it turns out, at least for JPEG, there is a possibility that the file size is in fact smaller. While of course the file size of a JPEG image is very dependent on its content and on its overall size, it appears that in a vast majority of cases, if you use progressive encoding for a JPEG image, the file size is smaller. One possible explanation for this is, well, because you are representing, say, the low frequency components of all the blocks that are close to each other, what you have is information that changes less, as opposed to a table describing basically all the frequencies in the same block. When you have information that doesn't change a lot or changes gradually, that's easier to compress, as opposed to trying to describe all the frequencies in one block at once because chances are, the information that you're going to get close together are going to be wildly different. At least, that is the one explanation that I see given the most, and well, it seems to make sense. And there you have it, that is progressive image encoding. Now, I actually did quite a bit of research to bring together this episode, so I'm going to do something that I don't normally do a lot, and that is to quote some of the sources that I've actually looked into. You can check in the video description, I have several links, and probably the most interesting one is the guy who actually collected over 10,000 JPEG images and actually did statistical analysis on them to find out whether, you know, it's actually a trend for baseline images to be larger than progressive JPEGs. Definitely an interesting experiment and definitely a very interesting phenomena that comes out of just rearranging all the frequencies in the same image. Anyway, that's all there is for this episode. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you gained some insight today, but until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may be interested in a playlist of my earlier work on computing and computer science topics. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.